Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to a, a special webinar here from TVIB. I'm Caleb King, a Senior Operations Manager located up in Paducah, Kentucky, and I want to thank all of you for joining this morning to hear a little bit about our revised annual survey checklist. And this is the document or, or the front page, if you will, uh, and we're going to show you how to get to that document as well and also talk about the uh, the revisions were throughout this. So you might be asking yourself, why is there a revision? Well, we do the revision to make sure that we have continuous improvement, which we all should be striving for, especially those who are in a safety management system or under ISO programs. And then also to an opportunity to correct any errors or omissions that may have been there uh, previously. So in general, how do we get our input? Well, we get that from our surveyors. So you'll see on our form, there's a place that says if we if you have an opportunity to see a suggestion, send it to us, let us know about it. So we catalog those and then we make sure they're included in the next revision if, if they're appropriate. Then we also have uh, additional details have been added in to help with wording where sometimes people have had confusion or maybe not quite understanding a question set. The new vessel section has had quite a, a robust bit of changes. We've added some requirements that previously were omitted, and we've also revised some wording for, for clarity that we just felt like previously maybe we were a little flat on the question set. We added that extra wording in to just make it a little bit better. And then lastly, we're eventually get this form into form.com, and uh, part of that is to make sure there's a citation for every question. Other things I want to point out that frame you can see here, we've got a couple of hyperlinks. All the little blue letters are hyperlinks. There's where you will find the clean version of the current revision nine of the annual survey checklist. You'll notice we also have a red line version. So when you go back and look at the clean version, you may not be able to pick out all the things that changed. So there's the red line version for you to look at. We'll be covering the red line version in some details today, but for a full review, print that out and take a look at it yourself or download it. Also, I want to point out that the revision date there, the revision nine is dated 2-22-2023. So that's when it was uh, by us, and now we've got it published out there for you to begin using immediately. Now, if you have some surveys that are ongoing or planned, you can use the previous version. That form will be retired on March 13th, 2023. So March 13th, 2023 and forward, you need to use the revision number nine form. Good deal. So let's take a quick high look at what's changed in the current version. So we've made plenty of administrative revisions. We've had to renumber all the questions in many sections. All questions now have a citation associated with it. So that there again will help us when we go into form.com to make sure there's a citation for each individual question. And then we've also made administrative changes to page one and two. So we're gonna show you these changes, or at least some of these changes today in this webinar. And when we do, we're going to use the red line version so it's a little bit easier to pick out what those changes were. On page one, we've just added a little bit of clarification here on the COI expiration date. Some people have been putting in the issuance date, but we really need to be capturing the expiration date. And the reason for that is, and you're going to see a question that comes up here in a few minutes, that the annual survey window is based off of the expiration date, so the month and day of the expiration. If you're looking for the anniversary date, you back into subchapter M, look in there and you'll see uh, what the anniversary is. It guides you to look at the month and day under the expiration. So we've clarified expiration date. We've struck that next line down that says either the owner or managing operator listed below must match what's on the TISMA certificate. We've taken that, that's a direct response from one of our surveyors giving us input. And as you can see, we've made some amendments down below that to where now we say operator is listed on COI and then TISMA certificate holder is a new box that's been added there. On the left, that remains the same. The owner is listed on the COD. So keep in mind, we're looking at the COD, the certificate of documentation for the owner, the certificate of inspection for the operator, and then you're going to look at the TISMA certificate. So there you go. You got all three of those key documents to line those up. You might ask, well, I didn't know that there could be a difference. Well, most commonly, there's not a difference. But as we know, the owners could vary all the way from a, from a company, could be a bank, could be a, all kinds of different entities can own a vessel. Then the operator is the one who's actually out there using it, 
on the river, but that could be a company name X, but there could be a company that has subsidiary companies where they hold one TISMAS certificate that covers their other operating entities. So owner, operator, and then TISMAS certificate holder. And then the last thing on page one, we've added in just for clarification, the last dry dock ISE for COI credit. So we don't want non-credit dates put in there. That's just the credit date. Then on page two, we've removed the greatest breadth, and we previously said as listed on the COD, but the breadth of the vessel is not a decision fact. Rather than collecting information that's not really used by the surveyor or TVIB, we've taken that off the form. And then lastly, on page two, where we have built the class, we've just clarified in there that if yes, which class society rules are being applied to that boat. So Usually it's, well, it's going to be one, one of two, either the rules for steel vessels or it'll be the one for the uh, inland waterways um, and uh, intercoastal waterways and rivers routes. So one of those two ABS rules. So there are key technical revisions that are in here as well. We've added some new questions, as I said. We've reworded some questions. And then to help point these out again, we're going to use the red line version. I mentioned the annual survey window. So we got the expiration date. So that is where the survey window is based off of. Remember, you go to the definitions in 46 CFR 136 110. So that's where you get that survey window. You know, anniversary date, excuse me, is defined. So this is a new question that's actually on the form now. So previously wasn't there because people were sometimes finding themselves outside of the window. So, for example, if you're in, in the shipyard period and couldn't get your survey done, there may be ways around that still finding. But the corrective action plan would be, for example, what you, you will do a survey prior to re vessel returning to service. So, and one more, the waste management plan for oceans, we've added in the definition that it's greater than three nautical miles from shore. And then potable water supply, we've added a citation. We've added that, you know, vent screens, for example, UV or other treatments. You may remember that within your TISMAS, there has to be protective measures and safety measures ensure your potable water supply is safe for drinking. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to Ken, and Ken's going to pick up from here and talk about a few of the other changes. Ken? Here we're just talking about the pilot house alerter. It's contained under the items that have been deferred until the COI renewal or within five years of the initial COI issuance. Pilot house alerter system or for vessels greater than 150 gross tons on international voyages require a Benoit system. The testing requirements are still contained in the same area, but we just wanted to take an opportunity and identify that and the requirements. Here we talk about deck house or hole penetrations, which open to the exterior and that may allow water into the to the vessel. This has been a common finding and one that we just wanted to amplify the information and articulate on the survey report. And here we've taken some time and just really wanted to meet what the CFR was actually saying. This is almost verbatim of that citing. So for flammable or combustible liquid, seawater cooling, firefighting, you know, isolation valves, their installation, are they labeled and what are the what is its function and is it identified for the crew? as well as through hole penetrations below the water line and just making sure that they're as close to the hole as practical and operable and accessible. This we want to take an opportunity on questions 9.2, 9.5, and 9.8 to just kind of minimize what was being captured there. Everything you see in the red line version is actually defined in 136.110 and it's just been removed and we've captured that as installed in 136.110 for the definition. So. This is for ITVs and lakes, bays, and sounds less than or greater than three nautical miles and what the requirements are. Okay, thank you, Ken. There were also some uh, changes, as I said, in the new vessel requirements section and probably far as a, a ratio, if you would, had the most change. 10 questions that have contained uh, minor revisions and then we've got uh, 20 questions with notable revisions. Uh, remember that the new vessels are subject to additional specifications. Uh, such as ABYC, ABS, NFPA, and those are all incorporated by reference. So just want to point that out. Now we're going to take an opportunity to open it up for any questions. Hey, Caleb. So as you guys know, in our recent switch to you guys, 
Um, the Coast Guard actually sent us electronic copies whenever they amended our COIs. And I noticed on the form and as per regulation, you know, specifically says valid COI, the original copy. So how are you guys viewing that? Because they're electronic copies. They don't have the seal on them. They should follow that electronic copy up with a hard copy that is physically embossed as an original that would be posted. Now, if they've only provided an amendment to the COI, as in page number two or number three, just because there have been changes, and the original page one with the vessel dates and information on it is still original and embossed, you can swap out the additional pages two and three with what they've sent you. But you should have an embossed original COI. If they have not provided that, definitely would want to reach out to them and request that. So then I do want to make sure you remember that the upcoming TVIB talks is uh, March 23rd. Uh, just stand by and watch for an announcement and registration instructions for that. So if there are no other questions, we're going to wrap this one here up. Appreciate you taking just a few minutes. The previous version retires on March 13th. Thank you all and have a good day. Y'all have a great one. Take care.